Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Luncheon with the Experts, the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Ibsen Biopharmaceuticals. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host this week and every week, and I'm a filmmaker and a writer, among a few other things. I've been working with CCF for 10 years, over 10 years, in fact, to create all kinds of video content. Uh, some like the, what you're going to watch today, live video series, Q&A style conversations, some patient-centric documentaries, some treatment-based, very dense treatment-based videos, event coverage, y'all, hundreds of videos, thousands of videos probably over those 10 years, but all with the same mission in mind, and that is to spread awareness and education about neuroendocrine tumors. That is what we are here to do today. Uh, if you are a regular to the show, you're probably already chiming in and saying hello. Uh, hello from Nepal, Michigan, Liberty, uh, South Carolina, Tom from Wisconsin Neuroendocrine Cancer Connection. Uh, if you're new to the show, new to the journey, also introduce yourself, tell people where you're from, reach out, embrace, connect with this community. I've never seen one within, within this space, you know, in the healthcare space, that's as strong as the net community. I can't say that enough. I say it every week, I believe, uh, I think the show is the value of the show is really twofold. The information you're going to get today from our guest and also the shared stories and shared experiences that you get from the community. So I promise you, uh, you will, you, they will embrace you back. They will help you along this journey. So I can't reiterate that enough to reach out to this community and become a part of it. It will help you on this journey before we move on with the show, we always want to thank our sponsors, Ibsen Biopharmaceuticals, because without their support, simply we couldn't have the show. And we always have this disclaimer from them before the show starts. That is the opinions expressed today by the guest presenters, as well as the questions asked by the audience, you all at home, haven't been uh, suggested or created by the sponsors of Lunch and the Experts. And CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of the views, opinions, or information provided in the presentation. Audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guests and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. So that last line is really the takeaway. We or our guests don't know your specific case. So we're going to give you some good advice. We're going to give you some good answers to your questions, hopefully, but take that advice and those answers back to your home team, which does know your specific case and make the best plan and path forward for you. Because one thing I'm, listen, I am not a medical expert, but I've worked with this disease long enough to know that each case of this disease is unique and therefore each plan and path forward as, is as well. So today I'm very excited to welcome back to the show, a second time guest and Dr. Diane Reedy Lagunas. How are you? I'm so well. I'm so glad to be here. Happy summer. Happy summer to you indeed. Uh, for the folks that uh, are regulars and attend the show, uh, last week I left, we had Dr. Del Rivero on and we talked about it. it was about a year ago when she was on last. It was about a year ago when you were on last. And she asked me about my baby boy who just had his first birthday. Oh, um, so I just got back from celebrating that at the beach with him. My mother had her 73rd birthday two days later. So I'm birthday out, y'all. I'm ready to get back to work. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm really excited to have you back on. And for, for folks at home, you're in for a treat today because uh, this woman's energy is infectious. I'm excited. See, look at her. That smile gets me every time. I love uh, this community. I love this show. <laughs> isn't it true, though? I mean, I feel like a broken record sometimes when I talk about the community, but it's, it is it is really strong and profound. And, and I think it exists between experts like yourself and support group leaders and caregivers and the patients themselves. And I, I really, I really love watching that. It's kind of, it's, I'm grateful to be a part of that community in, in some form. Uh, for those in the community that aren't familiar with you and your work, tell us a little bit about what you, what you do, where you work and, and the role that you fill in the community. So as you said, I'm, I'm Diane Reedy. I work at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, which is located on the Upper East Side of Manhattan Island in New York City. Um, not a lot of people here this week. I think everybody's taken off the 4th of July. I believe they decided it. to keep going. Um, but I have been in the neuroendocrine community for over 15 years. I did my fellowship training with Lenny Saltz, who did a little bit of neuroendocrine and colon cancer, and then came on faculty to essentially build our neuroendocrine program. And so it's been my second family, I would say, um, for close now to, uh, actually close to 17 years. My research interests are developing um, th new therapies for our patients, but equally, if not more importantly, are really focusing on quality of life as well. So, you know, trying to really think about financial toxicities um, using what we call patient-reported outcomes to understand, you know, what's important to patients and how they're feeling. 
Um, and then also sort of using genetic markers. We have a platform here for what we call next generation sequencing, where we're doing different genetic markers to understand neuroendocrine cancers. Unfortunately, as many on the call probably know, um, you know, our disease doesn't usually have a lot of what we call genetic mutations to help guide therapies. Um, but we're continuing to do work in that space and at least learning sort of, could we define what we call prognostically, you know, using these genetic markers to better understand which tumors may be a little bit more aggressive or potentially behave a little bit more poorly. And so we're continuing in that space as well. And as you said, Rain, it's just, it's tricky sometimes because thank heavens, you know, our community, um, I think in part is so strong because our patients can live for so long. So we get mm -hmm. to know each other over many, many years. Thank Great God. Point. Um, and so, you know, unlike other diseases I care for, we don't have that luxury, um, but that comes with other issues. You know, our patients, um, you know, can have this, this disease, which is a chronic disease, but comes with a lot of potential side effects and other things, but we get to, to know each other and to learn from one another. And so again, that's why I love the show so much, because it really allows us to answer questions that are super important that sometimes we may not get to in clinic or, um, you know, that we're just not bringing up. And I always love to learn from you all. And I bring it back to clinic and try to put that in my spiel when I talk to patients about what's important and what they need to know about the disease. So I learned just as much. Absolutely. You know, and you're not the first uh, guest to say that that really makes me proud of the show as well. It's, I mean, it's kind of a two way street, right. And I think that's, that's honestly right. the best way we make our, our way forward in almost anything, right. It's a collaborative effort. Yeah. Um, so folks, a little bit about the show before we get started, listen, we're going to have the show as soon as this show is done broadcasting live, it will post onto the Facebook page. And starting next week, I will repost it onto YouTube so that people that don't have Facebook can watch the replay. You can always revisit it. Um, but the real value is, is getting a question answered that you might be, might be struggling with. So if you know someone else that should be here, go ahead and tag them in the comments, let them know the show is going on a little bit of, uh, of information about it, really how to phrase your questions to help us, um, answer as many of them as possible. We get hundreds of questions. So inevitably we don't get to them all. And if we don't reach out to Carcinoid Cancer Foundation, you can message them here on Facebook. You can visit their website, carcinoid.org. They'll help get you that information. But, uh, we, we kind of mentioned, we not, we won't know your specific case unless Dr. Reedy is, is, is your doctor. And so we can't really field super case specific questions. So all the, the details about your case over 30 years, it doesn't really, it doesn't really help us because it's almost like too much information. And conversely, if it's too vague, it's hard to field too. So, but try to formulate your questions in a way that, that will give you the general direction or general answer that you need. Um, we're really going to try to help you. And we're, we're happy to take as many questions as you have, but that just makes it a little bit easier for me to field that question, to ask Dr. Reedy, uh, and to get a better answer for you, because we don't want to just say like, sorry, Kathy, we don't know your specific case and, and not give you the value we're trying to give you. Um, if you do have a follow-up question, you're still in the call, or if we need clarification from you, you can chime in later, give me a little bit of context to refer back to your previous question. We'll try to get that answer for you. Um, one last thing that you all do a very good job of, and I see it happening already in the comments section. If you see someone, uh, who has asked a question that you also have, or you're interested in the answer to just below the question or the comment, you can like it, love it, any of the motions that Facebook allows you to use. And they all work the same way for me. And that is to effectively upvote that question. If I see eight people have the same question, I'm going to make sure that we get that one across to Dr. Reed. So that helps me do my job which is, of course, to serve you. Uh, let's go ahead and start taking questions uh, from the audience. Dr. Reedy, we have a lot coming in. Great okay. audience are already. We're almost already at 100 people 10 minutes in, which generally happens about halfway through the show. So hey. they must be expecting a great show today. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Uh, from our friend Tom, Tom says, how prevalent is carcinoid heart disease? And, and, and how often do you recommend an echo? I love that question, Tom. The real answer is we're not sure. <laughs> Um, and I think that's a little bit unsettling and probably not the answer that you want. So for those on the call that may not be aware, um, about 15%, so not as high as we originally thought of our patients can make, or their tumors can have um, hormone secreting symptoms. So where the cancer starts um, often can help us think about what hormones may be secreted. So um, the most common carcinoid syndrome is um, in the 15% of patients that have either small bowel neuroendocrine or sometimes lung neuroendocrine, um, and rarely in the pancreas, but less common for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. The pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors can make hormones 
in overproduction that they would normally make in the pancreas. So what you see in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors is sometimes insulin or glucagon or other hormones. So carcinoid syndrome is usually unique to either small bowel or a lung. Having said that, what we have learned are the following. Number one, we honestly don't know who's at risk for it. Um, we do have a very strong suspicion that somatostatin analogs, octreotide and lanreotide, absolutely decrease that hormone production and thereby probably mitigate or abrogate the risk of carcinoid heart, but not entirely. So many um, patients, even when they're on octreotide, can still be at risk for that. Um, and unfortunately, and most importantly, um, it can be corrected with um, sometimes valve replacement of the tricuspid valve, which is the most common place, and carcinoid heart is damaged to that valve. Um, and when that damage happens, the, the valve gets leaky. And so it goes the wrong way, and you can get lots of um, problems with the heart, and it can actually um, sort of backflow into the liver uh, and eventually into the lower extremities, which could be a, a big problem because if, you know, if the pump's not working well and those valves are leaky, you could start to get quite symptomatic. Over time, that tricuspid valve damage could also be in the, what the next valve down, which is the pulmonic valve, and then very rarely the aortic valve, which is very, very uncommon. So it's correctable. That's the good news. The unfortunate news is that it actually could even recur. So we definitely want any patients that have evidence of the tricuspid, um, what we call valve regurge, that the, the, the valve is starting to get faulty, to see a cardiologist. Many of the patients can be managed conservatively, but many patients do require a valve correction um, and or replacement. And um, we really don't have good guidelines on how often do we need the echocardiograms. Certainly anyone that's symptomatic, and that's hard sometimes because with carcinoid syndrome with the disease, like defined by what, right? So in general, a little bit more short of breath, if you're exerting yourself and you're exercising and you're a little bit more winded, those are things you really wanna tell your um, physician about so that they can do the echocardiogram. And generally we say, and overall, if a compl patient's completely asymptomatic, but they have the carcinoid syndrome, to do an echo one to two years, just to make sure. And then any new symptoms, we just don't wanna forget about that echo. And I will say, um, um, again, unfortunately, sometimes it creeps up on us. So it's, again, the symptoms of clinically feeling a little bit worse, a little more tired, are things that you would want to get that um, echo. But thankfully, again, and very importantly, if you've never had those hormone secreting symptoms, i.e. the flushing and the diarrhea, or if that your doc told you you don't have a carcinoid syndrome, you cannot get carcinoid heart. It comes from the hormone. So in a patients that don't have hormone secreting cancers, they cannot get the carcinoid syndrome uh, heart. Got it. Thank you. Okay, next question. Uh, thanks, Tom, for your... Um, yeah, and I, for, sorry, Rain, I will say no, though, Tom, it's, it's rare. It's probably less than 10% if I had to make my guess, my best guess, but we just don't have a good number. Sorry. No, no worries at all. Uh, thanks, Tom. Appreciate your question. Good to see you again. I will actually be up in your neck of the woods uh, in a couple of weeks. My first time up there. Uh, question from Lynn. Okay, I had a primary that was a PNET, had PRT two years ago slight progression and KI67 was originally two and is now 18. So Lynn is starting CAPTEM now or CAPTEM. Does, uh, does CAPTEM help reduce KI67 and does it shrink or possibly kill the tumors? That's a very great question with a lot of information in there. <laughs> so let me see if I could try to distill it um, for folks on the call. So first and foremost, Lynn clearly knows a lot about our disease and that makes me so happy because it's hard sometimes to understand the complicated nature of our cancer. Sure. So what do we know about the natural history of our disease? So very often what can happen is what Lynn's describing, which is our cancer um, at first diagnosis under the microscope is considered what we call low grade. So for, I know many of you on the call know, but just to reiterate for those that may not, the pathologists tell us two things about the cancer when we were first diagnosed. One is what the cells look like. Are they mature and what we call well differentiated or are they uglier and a little bit larger, unfortunately, and they're called poorly differentiated when they're more immature. Um, in the well differentiated category, there are three buckets. You can have low, intermediate or high grade. And the pathologists tell us that based on this KI-67, it's a stain that they do and they can estimate the number. So low grade is 3% or less, mm -hmm. uh, or less than 3%, I should say. Intermediate grade is three to 20% and high grade is greater than 20%. Um, so what we can and do see over time is that over the years, the tumor can and often does 
change, not always, but, um, but often, mm-hmm. um, and that we can get what we call grade migration. So a lower grade tumor can eventually start to creep up into the intermediate and even high grade category over the years. How does that happen and why does it happen? It's not um, that we're, it's absolutely nothing the patient is doing or not doing for that to happen. It's probably what we call selection. So there are gazillions of tumor cells that never learn to grow or spread because of therapies that you were on originally, um, such as the PRRT or some, you know, many patients are on spinostatin analogs first. Um, But then the cells that are left over tend to be the ones that are just a little bit more resistant, right? So those clones, we call it, often do have a a higher KI-67 or a higher grade. Um, So then we pull out drugs that can often and will treat those tumors and CAPTEM is a very appropriate treatment uh, for an intermediate grade tumor and can really um, not only stop the cancer from growing and shrinking, but has a very high response rate, which means it can also shrink the cancer. Um, So I think the CAPTEM is a very appropriate treatment for any patient with a PNET, particularly an intermediate grade tumors uh, and can be very helpful. But I think the natural history of the cancer is that it often does change its grade but we don't know for any patient when that will happen and if it will happen. Um, And it often, um, you know, people ask me a lot, well, do I need to re-biopsy my tumor? The answer is no, because it doesn't really help us. Like the natural history of the treatment um, doesn't necessarily change based on that number. In general, in a patient, for example, that has progressed on PRRT and is a pancreatic net, CAPTEM would be a very appropriate treatment, irrespective of the grade. Because I could tell you, even if it were 3% or 18% or even 30%, there's still a very good chance of it responding. And so, you know, you don't necessarily have to do a biopsy to check the grade over time. It doesn't really help me take care of my patients any better to know that. Got it. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, hopefully that answered answer your question. If not, Len, uh, let us know. We'll be here for uh, another 42 minutes. Uh, next question from Stephen. Liver metastasis is a common eventuality for carcinoid cancer. What treatment protocols do you recommend for early and late stage liver metastasis? Are immunotherapy treatments being investigated? Great question, Steve. So we have several different types of liver treatments or modalities, thank heavens, for our patients to um, potentially consider. Uh, And all of them work well. And unfortunately, we don't have any trials yet to tell us which one's better. Um, So the RETNET study is a study that Dr. Sulin at Penn um, led, and we're also participating in that where they're comparing different types of embolizations. Mm -hmm. Um, I think many on the call probably know what embolizations are, but just um, to, again, reiterate, uh, this is done by our interventional radiologists. Um, where they go up through the groin and the femoral artery usually, and they go up into the liver and they could either do radio embolization where they place beads that are, um, have radiation on, on the outside and they can actually place them and kill the cancer that way. They could do bland embolization where they go up to the artery that's feeding the tumors and block that off by shoving some gel or some foam in there. Or they could do chemo embolization where they go up they put in chemo and then they put in the gel and then they do both. So it's a bland plus a chemo. Um, the RETNET study is testing whether chemo embo versus bland embo, um, which one is better. Um, so we don't know that answer yet. If you look at trials where they're not really comparing each other, but they're using them on average, um, the response rates and the ability to control the cancers are about the same. Mm-hmm. So um, equally, again, important is, okay, but which one's harder on the patient? Does look like chemo embo is a little bit harder, um, but bland embo is also no free lunch, depending on the, what we call the tumor burden. So the higher amount of disease, um, the harder it may be, because when you kill all that cancer cell, it hurts. And so patients can get a lot of fatigue and nausea and vomiting and other things with bland embolization. So we do not know yet which embolization is better. So um, the retina will at least help us understand what chemo embo versus bland embo. I think importantly, as many people know, we get a little bit worried on too much radiation. So with the very important introduction of PRRT, which is IV radiation, um, we, we can and absolutely do use radio embolization to deliver, which is safe, but we want to be very careful to not overuse that one because we don't want to cause damage to the liver, particularly in our patients, again, that can live for a very long time. And we don't know yet the very long-term side effects of radio embo in the setting of PRRT. 
So embolizations are definitely a modality we use a lot. I would note though, for any of our patients that have had Whipple procedures, embolizations are much higher risk um, mm. because of the risk of abscesses and bacterial infections because of the new anatomy that's created after a Whipple. So it can be done, but it has to be done cautiously with antibiotics. And there's still a real risk of uh, infections, which can be very serious in a patient that's had a Whipple. What else could we do? We have surgeries for debulking, particularly if they're big tumors and your hormones, um, the tumors are making hormones. And then actually we even have radiation therapy, which is a newer kit on the block, but can be very helpful in some patients um, to treat with radiation to, to the liver. So there's lots of different treatment modalities for the liver directed approaches, ablations and um, microwave treatments, whether it's thermal or microwave ablations. They can be done, but in general, it's called the rule of three. So that means they have to be three centimeters or less and less than three tumors in total in the liver for ablations mm -hmm. to be helpful. And honestly, um, our disease doesn't generally do that. A lot of times, you know, unfortunately our tumors, not always, but almost always, it's more than three lesions. It's small lesions, but mm -hmm. in both sides of the liver and, and often too numerous to do ablations with, with a, a good effect. Got you. Thank you for that thorough answer. That's perfect. Oh, okay. Immunotherapy. Sorry. Cause I oh yeah. 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 So that last question said, are immunotherapy treatments being investigated? Exactly. Yeah. So uh, many, many trials on immunotherapy in our disease and have not yet um, proven to be beneficial. There was one trial that um, recently was done at MD Anderson mm -hmm. that used a combination of immunotherapy plus bevacizumab, which looked promising and positive. It was a small study. Um, the problem is that bevacizumab is probably active. That's also called Avastin. Um, that's probably also active in our disease. So how much of it was the immunotherapy versus the Bev versus both? We don't know because it was only single arm. So still trying a lot, many investigators, including our own here at MSK, um, to think about where the role of immunotherapy may be helpful in our disease, but has not yet proven to be as active as it is in other diseases, unfortunately. Gotcha. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, next question from Tanji. Tanji, uh, what is the likelihood of getting carcinoid cancer again once you've had it? A few other people have this question too, which I know is a big, broad question. So let's just talk about the generalities of recurrence and, and what's unique to this, this cancer specifically. Great question. Really, really important question. So probably less than 5% of the time, these tumors are inherited from an, or, or developed from a gene that was inherited from mom and dad. Okay. So meaning the vast majority of our patients do not have a gene that was inherited in the patients that have that gene, there is certainly a higher risk of developing a second, certain, a second cancer, a second neuroendocrine, um, in potentially other places and or other potential problems. So if you had that gene that suggested that you particularly MEN1, but there are others like VHL and, and other types of genetic, um, problems, you, um, definitely want to see a genetic counselor because they will screen to make sure that um, if you did have a second cancer that we could sort of treat that. So early detection to potentially go for curative intent. Having said that, some of the germline, even when you have small lesions, we may watch them and we often do watch them because they tend to be much more indolent, less chance to metastasize in many of those patients. And for example, in an MEN1, for example, um, sometimes the whole pancreas is at risk for many, many tumors. So you don't want to go in and start, you know, um, doing operations on the pancreas, which is not a forgiving organ. It doesn't grow back. And then, you know, you find another one a year later because that's, you know, from a quality of life perspective, it can be very, very hard. So we're careful in patients with inherited tumors to be a little bit cautious on when we need to treat. And often we can watch those patients for a very long time without doing anything. The vast majority, 95% of patients, I think when we're talking about uh, having another one, it's probably more like Rain said, which is recurrence. So what is the possibility of a second primary is low if you don't have a germline mutation, but there is a possibility for the cancer to come back. Um, and this is what's very unsettling. And this is one of my most, um, one of the most important questions because there's so much anxiety about could this cancer come back? And if so, when? The, if it, for example, had um, in the lymph nodes from a small bowel, even if it's in the lymph nodes, sometimes it's curative and we never see it again. Uh, we don't have any therapies in 2022 to increase the risk of cure. So there's no radiation, there's no surgery additional or and or chemo to increase the chances of cure when it's in the lymph nodes like that. But we do believe that it's probably better to actually start maybe at two years because the, the problem is that 
sometimes it doesn't come back for a couple of years. And the very unsettling thing is um, what can happen to many of our patients, and I try to tell my patients this at diagnosis, you know, we say, well, there may be something little in the liver, but we have to follow it up because it may be nothing. And often it is nothing. And it's very unsettling because our tiny little tumors can look like blood vessels or what we call perfusion abnormalities, which is just benign stuff. And so it can bring a tremendous amount of anxiety without knowing for sure if it's even back. Um, so I think that's something that um, sometimes all of us mentally have to get our heads around in terms of like, if it were to come back, um, when it comes back and, and how do we treat it? Because depending on the grade of tumor we talked about before, sometimes it doesn't come back for a couple of years. And often it comes back so slowly that you don't even have to treat it for another couple of years. The NCCN guidelines say in general, it's about 10 years before we say that the chances of it coming back is very low. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Uh, folks, we are not quite halfway done with uh, today's show. It is moving by quickly. You're having great questions already, and we are well over 100 folks in attendance today, so that's exciting to see. Next question comes from Julie, um, which I think this is a very important question. Uh, Julie says, my local oncologist says uh, has said he, he knows what to do with net cancer, but how can I be sure? Is it really important to see a specialist? Uh, and when would a patient need, uh, know it's time to visit a specialist? So this is a topic that comes up a lot, especially with this, this unique cancer. Thoughts? Such a great question, Julie. So, um, you know, it's, it's very fair and appropriate to say, how many patients of NETS have you treated per year? Because that is a good sign to understand like what, how well does he or she know the disease? Um, and if it's not a big number, or if they say, you know, well, I just don't understand this disease, you know, do you have a specialty center that you refer to? Um, if it's not, if it's just in the community. So having a connection to someone in, in a specialty center or in an, a major academic center, I do think is very important. Um, do they have clinical trials? Because clinical trials are so important, not only of our patients today, but also of tomorrow, because we have to keep making sure that we're getting closer and closer to that cure. You know, we definitely want our patients to live for many years and many decades. And so that requires new therapies and developments of the treatments all the time. And so having access to clinical trials is also an indicator that that oncologist understands the disease and understands what's out there and understands what's good for you to consider in both standard of care treatments as well as um, clinical trials. Um, and then I think it's important to really um, feel that the relationship you're developed with your oncologist is one of trust and understanding and connection. Because I think that, you know, this is a partnership and it's, you know, God willing, going to be a long journey. And you want to make sure that you have the confidence that that he or she is going to understand your own best interests. Because a lot of this disease is, is understanding the patient too. As I try to tell my patients, you know, because we have a lot of therapies, thankfully, um, you know, we have to know when to use what. And unfortunately, our signs, our trials, because of the heterogeneity of the disease and the rarity of the disease, unlike breast cancer, we don't have what we call sequencing studies. When I can say to you, first line therapy is this, second line therapy is this, third line therapy is this. Um, and so we often have to think about what's important for the patient, where they are, what the disease is doing, where it's located. And so there's a lot of things that come into play in terms of choosing what's the best therapy. Um, but a lot of what comes into play is also like, who's the patient in front of me? Are they going to take a big trip? Are they working full time? Do they have young kids? Like all of this is really important in terms of selecting the right therapy at the right time. Absolutely. Um, we mentioned sequencing there. Speaking of sequencing, uh, Jean or Jean says, uh, are you using PRT for PNET patients earlier in the sequencing than you did formerly? That's a great question, Jean. Um, the answer is depends. I think that, um, you know, PRT is a really important drug in our armamentarium. Um, and I think that um, most data suggests that PRT earlier looks better than PRT later in terms of what we call the progression free survival. However, every drug you look at when you do it earlier rather than later looks better. So if you use CAPTEM first, it's going to look better than if you use CAPTEM later. So that's sort of what we call the natural history of the disease. So sort of what I was talking about before, over time, the cancer changes. So we don't know for sure 
what is the right sequencing of these therapies to make sure that we're milking all these therapies for as long as possible. We have no data to suggest right now it's better to do PRT followed by CAPTAM or it's better to do CAPTAM followed by PRT. And so this is really, it, it comes down to an individual um, sort of decision with the patient, uh, unfortunately, because we just don't have great big data to tell us which is the best one to use earlier rather than later. Because again, and this is hard to understand, but like all data that you use early is gonna look better than if you use that drug later on. PRT, chemo, targeted therapies, whatever that might be. Next question from our friend Florian from Germany. I haven't seen you in a while. Good to see you back. Uh, I've heard that with lung nets, it's more the histamine that causes carcinoid syndrome, not the serotonin like in nets and other organs. Is histamine then also responsible for the carcinoid heart disease in lung nets? Great question. I will say that um, I don't know if we've truly uh, nailed down the culprit. In fact, I know we have not. Mm -hmm. um, I think most of us think it is not the serotonin that causes the, the carcinoid heart. Um, but it is interesting because somatostatin analogs do decrease the risk, at least by some data that we have. But is that because the somatostatin analogs lowers the serotonin or lowers something else? Is it lowering the histamine? Is it lowering some other, what we call cytokine or some other protein that the hormone's making? Um, we don't know, but I do think that lung nets unquestionably can contribute to carcinoid heart. Um, and I think you're right that the, it's probably not serotonin that is the culprit of the disease. Um, because particularly again, where we have them, patients on somatostatin analogs, but they still can, um, you know, recur. Uh, we actually have patients that have tumors that can metastasize to the heart. I don't know if that's happened to anybody on the call. Hmm. That could be terrifying to patients to see it, that they actually have a tumor that spread to the heart. Right. Um, but thankfully, um, you know, it doesn't usually cause, at least in our experience, um, you know, major problems there, but you definitely want to be careful about that. And it often will come up on PET. So the PET dotate now, you know, we're finding disease that we never even knew existed uh, and so in, in some ways that's good, but in other ways it can sort of bring on, um, again, another level of anxiety, like, oh my God, I have all this disease I never knew about, but we don't really know what the natural history of that disease would have done had we not even known about it. So we will pick up sometimes bone lesions and other things that are very small that may not ever actually continue to grow or, or do much. So I think it's a, it's sort of a, it's a fine line from knowing, you know, well, oh my God, I had five more lesions that I didn't know about, but did that really change the natural outcome of that patient? Probably not for a lot of our patients. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see who's next. Lisa says, one, or we've been talking about lung nets a little bit today, uh, and this is in the same space. Lisa says, what are the treatments for lung primary besides sandostatin? That's a great question. So um, we have uh, Everlimus, which is based on what we call the Radiant 4 data, which was a trial that included um, non-hormone secreting. So patients that didn't have any hormone-related symptoms of the lung and GI tract, and um, that definitely improved uh, progression free survival. It took the cancer longer when, uh, to, to grow, thankfully, um, when on Everlimus as compared to placebo, that is an FDA approved indication. Um, the drug Temidar also in phase two studies have shown, um, to be active in lung net. And so that is on the NCCN guidelines as another option, whether you use that with or without capecidine is a little bit of controversy, but most of us will combine capecidine with Temidar for the lung nets. Um, and I will say that we also sort of tend to include thymic in with the lung nets. Um, they have very similar biology. So, um, and they actually um, are close to the lung and they embryologically have similar types of cells. So um, lung and thymic tend to be lumped together when we talk about these therapies. And PRT, um, although no great data in terms of clinical trials is on the NCCN guidelines as a treatment option to consider. Um, so that is also something that may be a little bit trickier to get for, um, from the insurance company perspective, but it is something that the NCCN panel thought could be and should be considered for, for patients with progressive lung net as well. And I will say all of this is obviously in the setting of um, lung nets that are PET avid by dotatate scan uh, or copper, whatever, um, you know, somatostatin receptor functional imaging that your doctor wants to order. Um, 
lung nets is one of the neuroendocrines that often is not octreotide or somatostatin avid. And so that limits what we can use for some of those patients. And sometimes we also use the more traditional chemotherapies like platinum-based treatments as an option as the tumor progresses, what we were talking about before with Lynn, you know, as that KI-67 may change or that the, the pace of the tumor may change over time. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, next question from Carrie says, how is CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R technology being used to research, uh, used in research rather, to retrain cells to fix replication errors or specifically cause apoptosis in tumor cells? That's a great question. So um, I'm not in the lab, so this is not my expertise, but I would okay. say that CRISPR has been revolutionary in us understanding biology of cancers, mm -hmm. um, and of diseases in general, and that the technology itself allows us in the laboratory, at least in 2022, from what I'm aware of, um, to manipulate cells and take out a gene and see what happens to the cell and put in another gene and see what happens to the cell. So it gives us an opportunity in what we call in vitro and sometimes in, in animal models too, to better understand, um, like the question was, you know, apoptosis, which means cell death. So how do we turn on and turn off cell um, signaling so that we know how to kill it and how to turn it on and turn it off and understand the biology of the cell so that we can get a better understanding what happens in vivo in all of us um, to be able to then think about what therapeutic targets may be the best approach. To date, we have not used that technology in people to better understand, you know, where we can potentially treat and, um, you know, define a therapeutic target. Uh, but in the laboratory, it's been absolutely critical. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Next question comes from Kim on behalf of her husband, who is 11 years post-diagnosis with a PNET, uh, beginning to have issues with high blood pressure and low blood sugar while on insulin pump. Are these symptoms concerning or is this a natural progression? So that's a great question. And there's a couple of things. Obviously, this is one that um, would be hard to exactly say what's going on without, you know, knowing the patient and knowing the records and scans, et cetera. But I would say that, um, so in our patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, um, there are a couple of issues that we have to deal with over time. The first is many of our patients have surgeries and because of the tumor itself, even if they don't have surgeries, can get a pancreas that's not functioning as well. The pancreas, again, it's not a forgiving organ. It can get sluggish. And one of the most important jobs it has is to make insulin so that our glucose stays regulated. And so whether it's from the surgery or the tumor itself or some treatments, often the pancreas doesn't make the insulin like it's supposed to, and we can get diabetes. Adding on that, most somatostatin analogs um, or patients on somatostatin analogs also have a trouble with hyperglycemia. So the drug itself can cause elevated glucose. So you're putting that together and we have lots of reasons why we can have high blood glucose, which requires patients to be on insulin and even sometimes on the insulin pump. Now, over time, um, that can get worse. Sometimes it can get better, um, but I do think that the um, sort of sluggishness of the pancreas is often related to the treatments that we have, whether it's surgical or medical. It is important though, in some pancreatic nets, and I don't think this is the case here, but I just wanna always make our patients aware. We do have a small fraction of patients, I would say less than 10%, but still something to consider where they can start making hormones that they never made before as the tumor is over time. Um, you know, sort of in, in the body, it can start to, again, those clones that could potentially change the K67 may change, but they also can start to randomly make hormones like insulin or glucagon or other troubles. So if all of a sudden you have symptoms that you haven't had before, I do think it's important to bring that to your doctor's attention and make sure that he or she does the appropriate tests. Um, if you started to get flushing or diarrhea or any other symptoms that you just never had before, make sure that you bring that to the attention of the doc so that they could do the appropriate workup. Got it. Thank you. Uh, from Edgar, uh, should a person with carcinoid heart disease refrain from eating foods that are high in, high in serotonin, such as bananas or walnuts? Great question. So in general, we have said that any patient with carcinoid syndrome should potentially avoid um, foods that have high tryptophan because that can actually lead to serotonin. So those types of walnuts and aged fruit, um, cheeses and other things, um, in part because it can increase uh, flushing and maybe other symptoms. 
it's a big leap though to say like we know flushing it's kind of annoying and our patients you know say well, it doesn't really bother me but it feels like i'm a little some some of my patients say i'm a little embarrassed sometimes because all of a sudden i'll turn bright red the flush itself is not dangerous um so i think that's important for patients to know but it is a marker that these hormones are being whatever those hormones are as we've discussed before that are causing the flushing um are there so I think, you know, it's, it's sort of in moderation is what I tell my patients is okay. Because if you flush a little more, cause you ate a piece of cheese that led to that, it's, it's okay. It's not going to be damaging to you or to your heart per se to do that. I think it's more complicated than what we're eating, but I think everything, you know, sort of key to live by in life is everything in moderation. So I don't want everybody, you know, eating bad cheeses all day long, or, you know, those certain cheeses um, that have a higher rate of tryptophan or the walnuts, et cetera. Understood. Thanks, Edgar. Um, from Douglas, generally speaking, how often can bland liver embolization be repeated? Great question. So, you know, I have patients that have done bland embolization eight or nine times. So you can do it many times. The, the more important question is um, how much bang for the buck are we getting for the embolization? So in general, um, the study suggests that when embolization works, it's about nine to 12 months where it keeps the cancer stable and then we'll start to grow. And if that happens, you absolutely can and should re-embolize. And sometimes as many of people on the call know, you know, you may have some tumor growth after embolization and then your, your interventional radiologist goes back and says, actually, we never really got that lesion because of the vessel anatomy and it's a little bit. So I think we should, and that's not actually real progression because it actually was never embolized. So that's, you know, one that you could and should go back because, you know, because of the peculiar anatomy, they're going to try to get the vessel in a different way, for example, if they can do that successfully. But if you find that you do an embolization, which is no free lunch, and it does cause some damage to the liver, the liver, unlike the pancreas, is forgiving and it will damp, it will repair itself until it can't. So we don't want to hurt the liver too much because it's, you know, it's a precious organ. Um, but it will, you know, be able to um, get better. However, if the tumors are growing within three months, for example, and we've already embolized them, um, or even three to four months, in my opinion, that that's a failure. So you don't want to repeat embolization when you do it. And after just a short period of time, it starts to grow. So it's really more of the biology of the tumor and how it's responding to the embolization as opposed to the true number of times. Because if you did it every nine to 12 months and you're doing it that way for, you know, and that's the only thing that you need to do, um, then it absolutely can and will be repeated and should be. Uh, and I don't think there's a limit in that way, but there's definitely a limit that, you know, you do it, and then, you know, our next scan shows disease progression, then you want to go to another approach. Got it. Thank you. Next question uh, from Fred. Uh, Fred is uh, soon going to be receiving some significant dental work, and he's wondering if the painkiller Novocaine has any negative effects on a lung net. And I think this is also, there's also a, a larger question here too, which is any, any painkiller impact any net potentially? Yeah, the answer is unlikely. Yeah, okay. I think that you absolutely can and should get any pain medications that you need um, for any dental procedure if the dentist thinks it's appropriate. And, mm -hmm. you know, there were, um, I would say, theoretical concerns for certain um, anesthesia or local um, anesthetics uh, in patients with carcinoid syndrome that had the flushing and could it somehow alter the blood pressure. Um, the, the reality, and there's been a lot of work, um, Dr. Um, Pommier, um, over in, in Washington has done a lot of work and he's probably been on the show to talk about it, but you know, he, even when he's in major surgeries, the possibility of what we call carcinoid crisis is exceedingly low. So what is that? So carcinoid crisis is only in patients with carcinoid syndrome where they get the flushing and the diarrhea. The concern is when you have an anesthetic or certain medications, could it drop your blood pressure even more? and require, you know, um, some resuscitation, which is essentially octreotide to treat it, it's exceedingly uncommon. It really does not happen in the dentist's office from what we can see by, you know, data. Um, and pain medications also do not exacerbate that. So I think, you know, a lot of our patients in particular, because we do live with our cancer for a long time, um, feel worried about, you know, not wanting to take pain medications for fear of addiction or tolerance or other things. But the reality is, 
you want to get the right pain medications, but you want that pain addressed. Our patients should not be suffering with pain. Uh, and there are many different types of pain and there are different even um, local injections and other things that can be done when uh, we have pain. So you want to get the, you know, either your oncologist or a pain specialist to really address whatever pain you have, because if you don't, that leads to fatigue which leads to energy issues, which leads you to not do the activities that you want to do. And that's just not okay. So we want to always, you know, my, my mantra is we take care of all of you and not just the disease. So whatever symptoms you have, just make sure that you're, you know, sharing with your primary team, what those symptoms may be so that they can get addressed. If we, if we don't know, we can't help. Mm, that's a great point. I appreciate that. Um, Dr. Reedy, normally I wait to give our guests the, their flowers from the attendees towards the end of the show, but there's a couple of statements I just want to read to you. We've got about 15 minutes left, folks. Mary says, thanks for explaining things so well. We appreciate it. Uh, I, I have to agree with Mary. You do such a great job. That's one of the reasons I was excited to have you. And where was Bruce says, hello to the best doctor in the world. Quite, <laughs> quite a compliment. Hi, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, 15 Don't tell minutes. anybody. He's one, of my, he's one of my favorite patients. <laughs> I'm just joking. For anybody else that's on the he's call, special, I love you. Bruce. <laughs> um, Carol says, how many years of follow-up, MRI, CT, are typical after tumor has been removed and no fur further problem has occurred? So the, the, the textbook or the NCCN guidelines say 10. Okay. Um, we, you know, could it, God forbid, come back after 10? Answers yes, probably, uh, but it's exceedingly unlikely. So at least ten years. I think there are some exceptions to that, um, but in general, that's that's a good amount of time. Got it. Uh, from Jim, I have nets, but also stage four CKD. What treatments are off the table due to kidney disease? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, so probably the first one is the PRRT. Um, mm. unfortunately we just don't have great data on patients with chronic kidney disease because, you know, our kidneys are responsible for flushing out that treatment. And so if the radiation can't go through the kidney to get excreted, um, those are the patients that can, you know, get really, really sick. Um, the other drugs, um, again, there's, um, spinosad analogs can and can, can and should be used, um, but Everlimus is another one that's tricky because that gets, um, altered a little bit by creatinine clearance. Um, there are some chemotherapies that are very safe to give. I would say the most important one on this one is to ha have your kidney specialist, mm -hmm. um, weigh in on that. And often even the drugs that we can do in terms of like the, the pace of the disease, if we're going to use chemotherapies, we just have to tie time it around, you know, um, if, if you're stage four, so I don't, if you're for patients, even with dialysis, I should say, we do give it, but we have to time it around the dialysis. So I think, you know, one of the most important questions I would say though, is like, it's a risk benefit thing. So the kidneys are very precious um, and we don't want to damage those. And so depending on the natural history of the disease, you know, thank heavens, if it's stable, we're going to be very reticent to add on additional therapies because we don't want to hurt the kidneys. Um, so it's always a risk benefit thing of like, which is more important to treat? Is it the neuroendocrine or the kidney? Um, and then everything with lower doses could be, you know, at least considered in terms of the traditional chemotherapies, um, but would really drastically have to change the dose and the cadence, you know, how often we're giving it. Uh, now we've mentioned carcinoid crisis today, but I have a question for Paula says, can you discuss the symptoms of, of carcinoid crisis and go into that a little bit more? Yeah, again, it, it's very, very rare. And so mm -hmm. I do want, I'm glad that the question came up because I don't want patients to spend, you know, too much concern about this. It's typically the, the scenario is in, in, in an operation, to be honest. So okay. when the anesthesia happens, um, and particularly when the tumors are being manipulated, the idea is that there's a surge of hormone that's being released and then the blood pressure drops. And so the anesthesiologists, you know, on a board question would need to know, you don't want to use what we call vasopressin or other blood pressure medications to help raise the blood pressure because that could potentially exacerbate it. So they usually have octreotide on hand to give the octreotide or, you know, um, equivalent, you know, short acting spinosatin analogs during the surgery. Um, that's the sort of scenario, but it's very unlikely to happen Otherwise, but the, the sort of idea of a procedure where you're getting anesthesia is where the carcinoid crisis comes in. Got it. Thank you. Sure. So here's a quality of life question. Uh, this is from Wendy, who's a friend of, of the show for sure. Uh, what drugs should we take for anxiety? 
any any thoughts about that if it pertains specifically to net patients or or not i'd, I'd love that question so um the answer is it does not look like any drugs um are prohibited from our patient population uh, even with the carcinoid syndrome so we did a big study here five, six years ago, looking at SSRIs. So, so the idea is, you know, the, the traditional Prozac or Paxil or Effexor, you know, drugs that can help both depression and anxiety um, because they are what we call selective serotonin inhibitors. So they prevent serotonin from being broken down and could they potentially exacerbate the carcinoid syndrome? And the answer was no. Um, so that is very selective to the brain at, at we call a synapse at the, at the very tip of the nerve, as opposed to in the gut and all these other areas um, that could potentially, you know, the worry was, could it exacerbate diarrhea or flushing or the carcinoid syndrome? And at least on our analysis, it did not look like that was the case. So we do not believe there's a contraindication to any anxiety meds, particularly the SSRIs, which would be the biggest concern um, in our patients. But definitely, you know, there are many different anxiety meds on the market, and that's one where, you know, your doctor, your psychiatrist would be helpful in um, knowing your own symptoms, what would be best. Got it. Thanks, Wendy. Good to see you. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, from Sheila, what are some of the other medical disorders and diseases showing up uh, comorbid with NETS or carcinoid? Great question. So I think first and foremost, as, as many on the call probably know, being on somatostatin analogs over a long period of time can cause um, what we call cholecystitis or gallstones, mm -hmm. which often don't do anything, but can lead to gallbladder attacks requiring removal of the gallbladder. So um, gallbladder, what we call pathology is something that's pretty common in our um, disease and something that we have to worry about. We talked a little bit about elevation of glucose and the potential for diabetes based on the treatments, particularly in our patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So that's another one that we have to worry about. Um, and I think that, um, you know, we don't, we know that there's some correlations with some other things like um, there was one study that shows a correlation to polyps and neuroendocrine disease. I think they're probably true, true, unrelated, but we really want to make sure that our patients always get screening uh, with colonoscopies starting at age 45, uh, based on the American uh, Society of Gastroenterology, um, and or earlier if you're symptomatic, um, and every five to 10 years thereafter. Um, and, you know, obviously mammograms and those types of things to be able to make sure that we're doing early detection for, for breast cancer, prostate cancer for, for men at appropriate ages after talking to docs, et cetera. Um, so I don't know if there's, um, you know, and then certainly in, in, again, in tumors where there may be an inherited gene, there's other diseases that could be associated with it. Um, but I think in general, you know, again, one of the biggest problems um, is, and it's, it's a good thing, but I want to make sure that our patients live very happier, healthier lives for as long as possible. And so we have to be very mindful and careful of the treatments that we're giving, because often the side effects of the therapies, you know, they're no free lunch and they come at cost. So uh, another common side effect is what we call pancytopenia is lowering of the blood count. So after therapies such as PRT or CAPTEM or all these different therapies, sometimes our patients can get trouble with anemia, lowering of the platelets, knowing of the white cells, uh, and then very rarely, you know, damage to the bone marrow that can lead to a lot of uh, problems and a very, very rare, but serious risk of leukemia. So I think because of that, um, we have to be very mindful of what therapies we use and for how long. So I never, for example, use CAPTEM for longer than a year. There was a new study that came out that said being on CAPTEM for longer than a year is probably not a good idea. We tend to use it for six to nine months in patients that are on that therapy. Uh, and again, because we want to be able to use and offer all these different therapies. And what we don't want is for patients to get lowering of the blood counts, which can be permanent. And then we can't get in the other therapies because your counts are too low. Got it. Um, from Jim, uh, are there any new clinical trials and or newer treatments for nets that have metastasized to the bones or spine? Thanks in, in advance currently have uh, in liver and some bone areas. Great. So great question. So in general, any clinical trial um, could still be, you know, helpful in patients that have bone metastasis. I don't think that we have a specific to bone per se, mm -hmm. um, but there are, you know, great trials out there. Um, I would say just a plug, you know, trials are investigational. It's what I do at MSK. It's, you know, what many of my dear colleagues and friends in the community try to do again, trying to improve the therapies that we have. They may work. They may not work. They may do potentially harm, you know, and that's why it's incredibly courageous for our patients to go on these trials. Cause we think 
the science suggests they could be really good, but they may not. And so I'm, I'm hesitant always to have patients travel too far for these trials, depending on the trial. So I think that's always a conversation you want to have with your doc to say, is this a good trial for me? Because being in the comfort of your own home, your family, like that's therapeutic too. So you know, I always worry about going for a phase one study or a phase two study in another state, for example, unless there's a strong biologic rationale. Um, but I will say that it's pretty um, common that over time, our disease likes to go to the bone after it goes to the liver. So it's, you know, again, nothing you're doing or not doing, but that's pretty typical. Um, and often, you know, for, for any symptoms of bone disease, we use radiation a lot to help those um, tumors as we're trying to think of what trials or other investigational therapies could be used um, as other options. Got it. Thank you. Next question from Lori. Uh, again, kind of uh, a quality of life quality of life question. What is your opinion on taking CBD, GBG, hemp gummies, things like that? Love that question. So, um, <clears throat> just a plug. We actually started a podcast at MSK called That's Cancer right. Straight Talk. Uh, which is going really well. We have close to over 90,000 downloads, which is, is great. And it's, it's about, um, you know, the conversations we're having are for anyone touched by cancer and or their caregivers. Um, and this was one of the hot topics, CBD. Sure. And um, there's no question that it can have help some symptoms. Um, and, you know, the, the story of how that drug in particular got so politicized is, is pretty sad. Um, but in general, you know, it's, it's a drug that you can't overdose on, unlike most of the drugs that we have, um, and can very much help with nausea, um, for sleep sometimes, but in the right hands and with the right doc diagnosing, um, and deciding on the best, uh, doses for that therapy. Uh, it's a little bit of a stretch. You know, there's a lot of stuff out there that claims that it can help treat disease, and I don't think, you know, at least cancer disease, I think um, for seizures, it's shown to be helpful, but mm -hmm. outside of that, it probably does not. Um, and there's really no data at all to suggest that it can actually help in therapy of the cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if you don't have symptoms and you just wanted to try it just because, I think we'd have to sort of ask, well, why? Um, because I do think that there's, you know, a lot of sort of hype out there on the benefits or lack thereof of CBD, but there's no question that for many symptoms, it can be very helpful and probably a less side effects than other therapies that we would use in different categories that have their own problems. Good point. Uh, from Jim, are there any um, AAA slash Novartis treatment updates in the US regard or using alpha targeted Lutathera? Great question. So right now, alpha um, targeted for, for those um, that may not be familiar with alpha versus beta slash gamma. Mm -hmm. So PRT, um, the FDA approved drug right now is um, radio labeled octreotate or lutetium-177 dotatate, i.e. lutathera. Um, and that drug is um, lutetium-177. Um, there are other types of radiation or emitters and alpha is the newer kid on the block. And in mm -hmm. prostate cancer, after traditional uh, lutetium treatment, like after the traditional PRT, giving alpha caused amazing responses again, which is super exciting because the idea is that even after this great drug PRT, you can use another therapy that could work just as well, if not better as a second line therapy. So lots of excitement in the neuroendocrine community to potentially test that in our disease as well. Um, a couple of things though, patients with prostate cancer tend to not have as long of a survival benefit as neuroendocrine. And so a little bit worried on the long-term side effects of that therapy that has not yet been tested well in our disease. Um, there is a study going down in Houston right now on alpha, and there is a study um, moving forward, which I'm hoping would be sometime in the fall to open uh, and testing alpha. Right now, the study um, is very strict in its eligibility criteria. Um, I'm working on trying to change that part, um, but in patients that have progressed on PRT. Got so it. more to come. So I don't know exactly when and where, um, but sometime in 2022, I'm hopeful that it will be, um, out to be enrolling patients. Got it. Thank you. Well, uh, that's our show today. That is weird. It's one o'clock. It, so it went by so fast. Uh, and listen, multiple people have said and agreed with the statements we said earlier. Donna says, love the way she answers questions. So we really understand. I can't agree more. And you're, and you're one of my favorite guests and favorite types of guests to have, because that's so important. You know, there's a lot going on. It's confusing at times. 
people are scared, they're unsure which way to go. So, so really answering in, in, in a way that's easy for people to, to understand is, is a skill. And I appreciate you sharing that, sharing that skill and your knowledge with us today. No, it's my pleasure. It's really, it's such an honor. And you're all the reason why I do what I do. And I think, you know, I always want to make sure that patients understand, you know, there, there are a lot of folks out there sometimes with a lot of conviction, like you have to take an aggressive approach Mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it's, it's quality and quantity, you know, it's Mm -hmm. how do I keep you, you know, all of our patients with us for as long as possible and as well as possible. And sometimes, you know, there's no free lunch on any treatment that we give. Mm -hmm. Um, but having, uh, you know, a primary team that understands the natural history of the disease and your disease and you is so critically important. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, um, you know, it's just an absolute honor and and privilege to be here and to do what I do. Well, we appreciate you. And and you know, that uh, also that word, I mean, and that expression quality of life is subjective. I mean, it it differs from patient to patient. So I think it's so important what you said earlier, that is this kind of collaborative relationship between, uh, you know, uh, providers and, and patients. So I think, you know, people have to really examine themselves and think about what that means for them. So that's a big part of what we try to do here too. Folks at home, we thank you as well for being here. And as always, we hope this program helped answer some of your questions and I'll reiterate one more time. I know that we have tons of questions and we didn't get to them all. So if we didn't get to your question, please follow up with CCF uh, at carcinoid.org, their website, or just here on the Facebook page, you can send them a private message. And also we'll be back every, every week. So uh, if you didn't get your question answered, I encourage you to come back. I also encourage you to look at our database. As I said, in the beginning of the show, I've created countless videos for the foundation and somewhere uh, in the, like whatever your issue is, I can almost guarantee we have a, a, a video on that topic. So use that resource. It is for you. It is free. That is why we do what we do. Thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Ibs and Biopharmaceuticals. We could not do this show without them. And finally, my name is Rain Bennett. I have been your host. Thank you for watching. And please join us next time on Lunch with the Experts. Stay healthy. Stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.